Hello everyone and a very warm welcome to our webinar today. Thanks very much for joining us. Uh, please note that the event is on the record and a recording I think will be available publicly after this session. So we, we will have uh, some interventions from our three panellists today and after that we'll have time for a Q&A. So please do use the Q&A box throughout to type your questions to the speakers. So before we get to that, I'll just briefly set the scene. Um, so basically COP15, which begins in two days time in Montreal, has a really big uh, main goal, which is essentially for parties to the Convention on Biological Diversity, which includes most countries, but not the US, to agree on the post 2020 global biodiversity framework. So this framework sets out 22 action targets to be achieved by 2030, 10 milestones for 2030 and four goals for 2050. And really importantly, this framework follows a decade of failure to meet the previous global targets, the Asia targets from 2011 to 2020. So the stakes are incredibly high at this conference. There are many sticking points going into COP15. Only one and a half targets from those 22 have, have been agreed so far. So there's certainly a lot of work to do at the event in the workshop preceding it as well. Uh, some examples of those unagreed areas or targets are the area-based targets. So this is the 30 by 30 target to basically protect 30% of land by 2030. And, and, and this one of the main issues around that relates to whether they'll be implemented using anthropocentric or ecocentric rights-based approaches. Also the elimination of harmful subsidies and major reductions in nutrient source to the environment. So that's about 50% reduction target and pesticides, which is a 66% reduction target, are contentious. There's also disagreement of a common but differentiated responsibility, whether or not this issue is relevant to supporting conditionality in finance, for example. Access and benefit sharing has been identified as a red line for some countries. So there's been a proposal from Africa for a 1% biodiversity levy on the retail price of all products based on genetic resources and digital sequence information. Coming back to the main uh, focus of our event today, financial flows are a major sticking point. Finance for nature and biodiversity contained within target 19 of the global biodiversity framework is one of the most debated targets. One example is resolving financial flows from high income countries to low income countries in the global biodiversity framework text with potential figures around that ranging from 10 billion to 200 billion per year until 2030. But I think maybe on a more positive note, a number of countries have pledged more funding and countries have broadly agreed on the need to increase financial support to low income biodiversity rich countries, but the amounts and delivery mechanisms are to be uh, decided. So we'll now turn to our fantastic panel of speakers who I'm delighted to introduce. So we have Isabel Hilton, who's the founder and senior advisor of the China Dialogue. Grant Rudgley, he's program manager of sustainable finance at the Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership. And Henry Boucher, who's partner, head of investment strategy at Saracen and Partners LLP. So each speaker will now give us around up to eight minutes of remarks and we'll go in that order. So that would be Isabel, Grant and Henry. So Isabel, over to you, thank you. Thank you very much, Helen, and, uh, and great to be here. Um, to those watching, you'll all have the benefit of tremendous financial expertise from the other two speakers. I'm not uh, one of the experts on finance, but I've been asked uh, to fill in some of the background on, on, on China's role and its position in the biodiversity process and to update uh, a little bit on the state of play. We've already had a very uh, 
uh, succinct and and uh, useful introduction from from Helen on on what remains to be done. We're all aware of the huge risks that biodiversity loss poses, but um, so far we have not managed to mobilize the action that we need. And there are many reasons for this, but I think as a general observation, um, having attended both climate cops and CBD cops. Um, the CBD process dates from the same Earth Summit as the UNFCCC, and though no one who's really keeping up would say that we've done enough on climate change, nevertheless, the understanding, the attention, the level of discussion on climate change is in much better shape uh, than that on biodiversity, which, considering the threat that biodiversity loss poses, is, is, is frankly disappointing. But as an illustration, China chairing the CBD COP this time round, um, Xi Jinping will not attend and therefore heads of government and heads of state are not invited to Montreal and given the state of the crisis, that's not a terribly good signal in terms of, of attention. And finally, climate and nature, uh, the two processes are really highly codependent and success in one very much depends on success in the other, but institutionally they run on parallel tracks until relatively recently and there is still a great deal more that could be done to link them. So um, COP begins in two days in Montreal to finalize, as we've heard, the new 10-year agreement. Uh, the last one agreed in HE in 2010. The Strategic Plan for Biodiversity 2011 to 2020 had 20 targets, none of which have been fully achieved. And it's perhaps worth noting that the previous decade was really no better. So we failed to halt, let alone reverse the mass extinction. We failed to tackle pollution, to protect coral reefs, or even to slow the loss of nature. The science report, Global Biodiversity Outlook 5, is extremely sobering. And despite some progress, natural habitats have continued to disappear. Vast numbers of species are threatened with extinction by human activities and 500 billion dollars of environmentally damaging government subsidies have not yet been eliminated. Now, there are some partial successes, um, including on protected areas, on invasive, invasive species, um, and there is an increase in the number of vital biodiverse areas which are now under protection, and that uh, brings me to China and China's record. So, as chair of COP15, China's challenge is to get a robust agreement uh, to replace the Aichi uh, agreement. And this, it's worth remembering, is China's first experience of chairing a process like this. It was always going to be a pretty stiff challenge uh, for a number of reasons, and they include China and its own record on biodiversity. It's a large biodiverse country. It has a very wide range of habitats, but it also has a very big population and a pretty dreadful record on biodiversity loss. Now that trend goes back at least 2000 years, but it was accelerated under Mao Zedong in the first 30 years of the Republic with truly catastrophic episodes, such as the Great Leap Forward, uh, characterized as Mao's war against nature, I think not unreasonably. And then in the period of reform and opening from the 1990s to around 2012, by rapid industrialization and very poorly regulated GDP growth, which also did terrible damage, including some notorious extinctions, such as the Yangtze River Dolphin. But the consequences of China's own failure to care for nature became very clear in the first decade of the century. And amongst other things, a very vigorous envir environmental movement emerged in China. So when Xi Jinping came to power in 2012, it was clear that China's economic model had to change. It was running out of steam in any event for any number of reasons. And the party formally adopted the theory of ecological civilization, which is now in the constitution. It emerged well before his accession, but it is particularly associated with Xi Jinping himself, which means that it is likely to remain fairly prominent as, uh, as a, a national and a party goal, as long as Xi Jinping remains in power. Ecological civilization seeks to put a value on nature to promote sustainable development and the circular economy, and China's very keen in this process to showcase its own record on things like afforestation, on redlining, and the establishment of nature reserves, all on the positive side. 
On the less positive side, China's external economic relations have been a major driver of deforestation elsewhere and, uh, and consequently of biodiversity loss. And China's own heavily subsidized distant water fishing fleet continues to contribute to IUU fishing. China also remains a center of the illegal trade in wildlife. So there are things that China needs to attend to um, and, and no doubt uh, uh, aims to do so. So although ecological civilization is firmly established at a policy and a rhetorical level, given that the Chinese economy has been driving in the opposite direction for decades, it is taking some time to get regulatory alignment with this new policy, let alone enforcement. And moving finance and investment in the right direction is proving slow. There is a growing awareness. There are various nature-friendly initiatives, including greening the Belt and Road. But for the time being, these largely remain voluntary. Now, as to China's role in the process, as we know, the pandemic meant that Kunming was both postponed and reduced. There was a virtual high-level leader segment in October 2021. A hundred countries signed up to the Kunming Declaration, which notably stamps Chinese, China's um, development language firmly on the process. It's called ecological civilization, building a shared future for all life on Earth, which very much chimes with other... Um, <laughs> regime slogans which China has been promoting in terms of global development. It talks of an ambitious and transformative post-2020 global diversity framework, et cetera, et cetera. It's all very, very good language, mainstreaming biodiversity and so on. Uh, what it doesn't do is establish a process or um, any agreed uh, uh, systems. And in Montreal, that is the task in Montreal, as we've heard, it's a huge task. And the, one of the difficulties is that getting Montreal to deliver means solving all of these unresolved tasks, all the square brackets. Uh, nothing will be agreed until everything is agreed and there remains a great deal um, to agree. So um, given that Aichi has failed, it's worth looking very briefly as to why it failed. And one of the reasons was that there was a failure of transparency, a failure of accountability and comparability, and in particular, a failure of finance. Finance for, for that process wasn't discussed until two years after the targets were agreed, rather than being discussed uh, in an aligned process as it is today. And that meant that the pledges and the commitments were made, but there was no support in place for the execution so it tended not to happen. If a deal is concluded in Montreal, it should be implementable uh, from the start, which is a very, um, which is a, a good development. So I think just on the Chinese role in driving this process forward, you know, given the weakness of the whole process, it would be unfair to single China out. But there are one or two things which we should note um, that have particular Chinese characteristics. One is the lack of experience in this kind of multilateral diplomacy. Chinese diplomacy is heavily geared to domestic politics, even more than many other countries. And the diplomatic practice tends to favor bilateral engagement where China can leverage uh, its own advantages of scale mostly. So success in this process, a process as complex as this demands a different skill set, as we saw in the French diplomatic effort leading to the Paris Agreement. It demands a clear set of objectives, robust alliances to help deliver them, solid and continuous consultation to understand and anticipate the roadblocks, who are the spoilers, what might change the position and so on. China has little experience of how to do that. And the pandemic meant that the practice uh, in any event would have been extremely challenging even were it to uh, engage. Chinese diplomats tend to be risk averse. The political system tends to encourage caution. Failing to meet an ambitious target is a very black mark. Meeting an unambitious one counts as success. Relations with civil society in a process as complex as negotiating a new 10 year plan for nature, the ideas and the influence of many sectors is important, be it finance, business, city level action or civil society. China under Xi Jinping has been increasingly hostile to civil society both within and beyond its borders. And this is a loss to the process and unhelpful. And geopolitics, where there have been successes in the recent past, geopolitics has been critical. 
So the Xi Obama handshake and pledge two years before Paris unlocked a degree of cooperation that helped to drive the process to a successful outcome. But it's since 2016, China's relations with the US have been in free fall. Its relations with the EU are not that much better. With its relations with Canada, which is its co-host, have been terrible since the two Michael and the Mung affair. And they weren't helped by Xi Jinping's berating Mr. Trudeau at their recent G20 encounter. So to sum up, China's domestic record is improving. Its diplomatic skills are no better than average. And they are further limited by the pandemic and constrained by the geopolitics. So I think I'm going to pause there and I'm very happy to take um, any questions on what China has been doing to make up for these, uh, these issues and on the outcomes of Kunming and on China's green finance, which uh, if anyone is interested, I can come back to later. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Isabel. It was a really great background to the whole thing and some of the other issues that really underpinned some of the bigger issues around uh, financing as well. Um, so, yeah, as Isabel said, please do put any of those questions that she called for in the Q&A box. And we'll now move to Grant, who will actually dive more into the finance aspects. Grant, over to you. Thank you. So I'm going to be speaking today about assessing nature-related financial risks. And this is at its core about connecting that context, which Isabel has just so excellently laid out about the decline of the natural world and connecting and integrating that decline into financial decision-making. So just to highlight some of the, the facts that um, Isabel alluded to, uh, we, the, the decline of nature is at this point extremely dramatic and it's it's driven by uh, our economic system being extractive um, in design. And you see on the right um, a chart and data that uh, Parthas has cooked to discard to include in his uh, re review of the economics of biodiversity, which in essence shows that we have been taking from the natural world and creating produced capital from that natural capital. Um, it's the very definition of unsustainable. And the, the question we have is, is as how to peak, that, <laughs> how to basically uh, reverse engineer this relationship and move to a, a regenerative economy. The, the decline of nature and some of the statistics that you saw on the last slide, uh, they pose significant financial risks to uh, investment managers, to banks, to insurers. And the simple reason for that is, is, is basically because any economic activity depends on the services that nature provides. This is of course very intuitive, but what we do need is we need to begin to build a framework around uh, that connection. Um, in essence, how economic activity drives nature loss, reduces ecosystem services, but in so doing creates physical risks uh, and then into in order to combat those those uh, physical risks that nature loss we see transition risks emerging and liability risks crystallizing and these are risks uh, for financial sector um, and when we began this work um, back in 2019-2020 at the Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership we began with this question of why we began by making this knowledge about the uh, from the academic domains um, relevant to the financial domains and, and in essence showing why this issue is material we then created a handbook that showed how specifically it was material and i'm going to run everybody through that very briefly at a high level to show how that worked and that in essence became a precursor for um, our role as an academic partner in the task force for nature related financial disclosures um, using this handbook we actually quantified specific nature related financial risks so showing where in portfolios these risks exist and how material they are and then inevitably there are gaps and challenges in front of us that require further action that we reflected upon at the beginning of this year so I've mentioned about connecting the natural worlds with the financial worlds. Um, this is the, the zoomed out version of our handbook. Uh, 
Um, I've mentioned your sources of nature related financial risks uh, on an earlier slide, beginning with nature loss. The key part of the framework that I'm about to show you is about the transmission channels, uh, of which there are six. Um, and this is where, um, for example, you have a landslide that takes out some infrastructure that disrupts activities, just to give you a really tangible example of one transmission channel. Um, but equally, uh, if you have the Amazon rainforest forest turning into savanna because there has been too much deforestation, then you will need to relocate a variety of agricultural assets on a permanent basis to give you an example of the third transmission channel. So these, these impacts on companies, households, and indeed financial institutions themselves, should they affect the property of financial institutions, they lead to uh, different kinds of risk. I'm going to drop down a level now. And the thing I want us to focus on here is really just this simple reality, which I think we do need to remind ourselves of, given that we have what I'd call a carbon tunnel syndrome, which is that we are so laser focused on climate change that we are forgetting that climate change is only one cause of nature related risk, only one cause of nature loss. And indeed, in many factors, in, in many instances, actually exacerbates the issue rather than being the primary driver of the issue. A uh, simple example, I've, I've mentioned the Amazon rainforest already. Um, the, the land use change as, as a driver of uh, ecosystem service decline is the primary driver, such as deforestation. But if we, um, if we then add on top of that climatic volatility, uh, that creates these vulnerability points for the remaining forest um, that make it vulnerable to tipping over. And there are many other examples. So basically what this framework does is it moves us through from a variety of drivers of nature loss to all the different ways that the risks can manifest, say the decline of habitat intactness, or hazard regulation or water security. And that's a distillation of all the different ecosystem service categories, then that impacts on companies, and then the resultant financial risk, be that credit, market, liquidity, or business risks. Like I said, we did a number of use cases that quantified these risks uh, with the financial institutions that you see here, both physical transition and portfolio mapping exercises. And I'm only gonna highlight some high level stats. I'm gonna skip over the detail but I'm happy to speak about it in more detail, in, in more in more in the Q&A if you like. So these are the, these are the high level stats. So the, the first one is this case that we did with Rubico, which was all about how soil health uh, across uh, Brazil is, is in decline and how exposure to degraded land to, to poor soil health creates significant vulnerability for listed companies in that supply chain, simply because if there is an extreme weather event, the soil is not resilient enough to continue producing crops and those that are connected to that soil, let's say if they buy crops from that soil, have to enter spot markets to source uh, new staple crops, other staple crops. Um, and if you are entirely exposed to degraded soil and you're a small packaged food company in Brazil, this was a real a company that we did this analysis on, the loss was up to 45%. I'll mention one other case study here and um, and then I'll hand it back to the floor, which is that we looked at water stress in East Asia, specifically using Cape Town as a proxy where the water table had been and had been mismanaged to, to a degree over a number of years and therefore made it far more vulnerable to drought. It had been overexploited, um, and therefore in other areas of overexploitation, we looked at the impact of water curtailment on heavy industry to a similar extent. Uh, and saw that three months of curtailment, similar to what happened to Cape, Cape Town, would lead to uh, a shift uh, in credit rating from investment to speculative grade. And this is in HSBC's actual portfolio and has led to uh, a, a much uh, stronger focus on this issue um, with those companies by HSBC. I'm not going to go into more detail than that now, but I'm happy to speak to the other use cases. I was asked to just give my reflections on COP15 for handing back, which is that, which is that to say that the mood music is not good. Um, the Paris Moment for Nature, which is to get to 30% uh, of land and marine environments conserved 
by 2030 does not look possible. Um, as uh, Isabel said, the heads of state are not attending. And in fact, it's even a struggle to get ministers of finance to attend for the first ever finance day. Um, that all being said, I can share that there are 50% more delegates registered for the COP than was anticipated by the CBD and that non-state actors are intending to uh, be out in force. And so I think that's very encouraging for the first time to see the financial community in particular engaging with this issue. And I think that does mirror what you're seeing um, in, other, in other areas, uh, their engagement with TNFD and so on. Helen, back to you. Great, thanks very much for that, Grant. Um, really interesting, and I think there's lots of things there that we could get into in more detail, as you said in the Q and A. So please, um, please put your questions in the Q and A as we move to our next speaker, uh, Henry. Over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Helen. I want to, in contrast to Grant, who's covered so many of the issues and how the risks can be integrated so well. I was going to focus a bit more on some of the behavioral issues uh, in financial institutions and perhaps some of the perceptions and practicalities of how we can generate the sort of scale of change that, that's really necessary and that Isabel highlighted so well. Um, so I think the first question then is how do investors currently perceive nature related risks? And the answer is really through a financial capital lens rather than through a natural capital lens. And they believe very strongly in free access to open economic systems. Unfortunately, nature is not an open system. It's a closed and, and finite system. And that is at the heart of, of the problem we face. I think the second issue relating to perceptions and attitudes is time scale. Um, everyone's aware that climate is a problem, but we have sort of initiatives like net zero by 2050, uh, the very mention of 2050 takes it outside most investment horizons and again creates a sort of attitudinal challenge. Um, and therefore, I think biodiversity loss um, isn't an obvious threat to a lot of people in day to day finance. Those that do consider the systemic risks are some of the very long term asset owners like sovereign wealth funds or very large pension funds or endowments, which have liabilities that stretch out for for multiple decades and therefore sort of better recognize their exposure to sustainability and finance systems. And so I think what we need, really need in order to be able to move the dial sufficiently is to address what some of the underlying factors within the system are. And perhaps the biggest impediment we face is that business is defined by um, the supply side. In other words, they're looking to um, grow their supply of goods and services over time. Investors are looking to then uh, generate rising returns from that growth in economic output. Unfortunately, solving our overuse of nature requires rationing. It means cutting demand. And therefore, there is this very strong conflict of interest, essentially, that we have to face up to. And there has, in the case of climate, already been very significant greenwashing um, that's been a major issue for financial regulators who are now actually introducing some very good new regulations and sort of labeling systems to investments to, to try and tackle that. Uh, but the underlying problem, I think, in perception um, remains that really the finance industry, it, it is becoming aware, but doesn't really want to be aware of this problem. The second big question then, I think, is, is what more is needed for nature to become integrated in investment practices? And I think that's where Grant was highlighting that there's some really excellent reporting initiatives uh, now underway, the Task Force for Nature-Related Financial Disclosure, um, the Global Reporting Initiative, uh, the ISSB, which is part of the International um, Financial Reporting Standards, um, will all aid sort of measurement of the problem. Um, but the key is not so much that we measure the issues, it's where we measure the issues. And I think that's really where the company accounts come into play because effectively the accounts are the key metric for any business. They act like almost the altimeter in an aeroplane. And if you don't know how high you're flying, then clearly you're in danger of, of crashing. So if you can get um, biodiversity loss and climate into the accounts, 
uh, you will really have a whole range of extra tools that enable these issues to be taken forward. So in particular, um, you know, the accounts are audited. You will have the auditor there. You will have um, accounting standards. You will have shareholder votes um, on the accounts. All of these sort of um, sticks, if you like, come into play, whereas if the um, disclosure is voluntary, you only really have a carrot. So I think, again, when we look at what's needed, um, there are perhaps some um, opportunities on the supply side, but they're nothing like the ones that have just been demonstrated in the States by the introduction of the Inflation Reduction Act, um, which has basically, again, really played to the supply side. It's offering $370 billion of incentives to replace the fossil fuel and energy um, industry with renewable energy. Unfortunately, there is no equivalent for biodiversity. There's no sort of quick replacement that um, investors can grasp hold of. Um, instead, as I say, there is there is rationing, which, which really requires regulation. So are there any other buttons we could press? Well, perhaps the final one then is, is to think about risk. And I think for risk to be even a faintly useful button to press to really change behavior, it needs to be a very big, very red and flashing light. It needs to um, really take account of financial risk and it needs to be identifiable and addressable by um, the finance industry. And I think that's really where many of these issues are treated as, as individual factors. Here we are with a COP dedicated to biodiversity. Um, we've just had one dedicated to climate change. Actually, these are overlapping risks. Uh, effectively, the, the challenge that many investors will face in the next few years is a poly crisis, um, which the historian Adam Too says is an economic and non-economic shock. Um, these factors combining together. And I think that's where, again, Das Gupta was able to create this sort of strong interconnection between the systems. And we need to really start to bring together so many of these factors, not just um, climate change and, and biodiversity loss, but um, many of the other uh, breaches of the planetary boundaries. So, you know, species loss, chemical and synthetic organic pollutants, um, ocean acidification, atmospheric aerosol loading, all of those factors, all are part of this big red flashing risk button. So to get everyone in the financial sector to address the collective action problem, the tragedy of the commons, if you like, I'm afraid we do need really quite strong regulation, but we also need to frame the discussion and bring it very much into the sort of behavioural aspects of, of the way that finance operates today. Thank you very much, Henry. Um, I feel like that was a, a whole lot of very fascinating and interlinked information in a very short amount of time. So it was very impressive. Thank you, everybody. Um, we do have a couple of questions already coming in. Feel free to, to keep those coming. We have now about 20 minutes for, for the Q&A, so plenty of time for you to uh, have your question answered by any or all of the speakers. Um, I just want to start us off with one of the, uh, I guess, bigger framing questions regarding expectations at the at COP15 in terms of whether or not the, the global biodiversity framework would be agreed or not. Uh, so as Isabel said, without the heads of state president and with the issues that she laid out regarding China's presidency, can we expect all 22 targets to be agreed in the next two plus weeks? Uh, and what are the expectations across the different actors that we've been talking about? So across governments, civil society, business, and so on. Do they expect success? Um, is that a really strong driver for them being involved in this? And given all of the risks that Grant laid out, is there a really strong push from a particular sector to actually achieve success at COP15? And then how does that uh, mirror or match with the, the issues that Isabel laid out around the presidency and the lack of heads of state being there? So I would pose that to any of you. Um, maybe if Isabel wants to, to go first, that's absolutely fine, but you're all very welcome to, to comment if you have any thoughts on that. I think, as you said at the beginning, expectations are not, I mean, it's very hard to be 
terribly confident about this process. Their expectations are not high. On the other hand, there is a sort of real sense of the among the participants that this is, um, uh, you know, that this is a very big moment. I think the idea that it was going to be the Paris uh, moment for biodiversity is, I think that's honestly unlikely to happen. And we'll be quite lucky if we get kind of a version of what we know is necessary uh, intact at the end of the at the end of the process. China won't want a failure, but it but China will probably reserve to itself the definition of success, and that's you know not not exactly the same thing. You can define success in lots of ways, um, and China will obviously seek to define success in ways that reflect well on its um, on its chairmanship. But I think that may fall quite a long way short of, uh, of what's required. For the emerging economies who are participants, finance is absolutely at the heart of it. I think they're not going to sign up to something as ambitious as 30 by 30, for example, which is a very big lift for many of them, um, without um, very clear indications of what resources will be available to make that happen. It's also not entirely clear to me, it may be clear to others, you know, what 30 by 30 means in a global context, you know, are we really talking about 30% of the global commons, the vital global commons, are we talking about 30% of every contributing country and so on. And that obviously, again, makes a difference to um, their confidence in approaching it. I'll stop there and let others pick up. Thanks, Isabel. Uh, Henry, Grant, anything you'd like to add? Um, so, I mean, just to reflect on my comments that I made during the presentation, I think that uh, I would agree with Isabel that you're not going to have uh, the financial community uh, signing up to any 30 by 30 type goals, uh, even if it looks like those will be agreed. Um, however, what I would say is there are some targets that are uh, really being focused on strongly by the non-state community. Um, target 15 is the one that I would highlight most strongly, which is about uh, it's it's in essence the, the TNFD target. Um, the people at TNFD don't hate me saying that, but it's it's really about your disclosure and monitoring and measurement of the relationship between business and finance and nature. And uh, we have a, a number of uh, big um, big commitments out there from coalitions and from. Uh, business and finance to to make it mandatory um, so business for nature would be the one that I would highlight has a big campaign to make it mandatory which focuses on target 15 so yes um, targets to uh, conserve to protect uh, those will be uh, challenging for the non-state community to to make but there are uh, there is a lot of already a lot of calls for uh, Tiger 15, for example, to be very robust. And nothing significant to add, Helen, but I, I would just pick up on Isabel's point on um, the 30 by 30, because obviously that's a more immediate timescale than, say, 2050, which um, a lot of people talked about with climate. Um, I think if it could be brought even further forward, that would be helpful um, because it brings it into the, you know, if there's a, an Overton window for finance, it, it's probably, you know, a, a timescale that's within the next two or three years. So you know, the rate of change required in order to get to 30 by 30 is extraordinary. And if that could be brought into people's actions in 2023, 24, in the sort of budgeting time frame, uh, that would clearly be very helpful. Thank you, Henry. And by people's, do you mean governments or is that business or just generally across sectors? I think it's generally government and, and business. Um, you know, they're all budgeting for next year and and, and the year after that they really, you know, have discount rates which immediately start to flatten the, the longer term um, components of, of any of that process so they need to have um, immediate targets that, that do impinge on the way that they're thinking now. Great thank you and we'll now go to some of the audience Q&A's so first of all from Malik Dasu and apologies in advance I will no doubt mispronounce your names is biodiversity a helpful phrase for businesses to integrate risk into their strategies? All the risks mentioned earlier were largely ecosystem related disasters. Yeah, so I guess what kind, what level of granularity do, do businesses 
find helpful or, or tend to use around those issues? Shall I pick someone one up, Helen? Okay, so um, yes, I can empathize with that point of view. I think the challenge that we have right now is that we have uh, three conferences of the party set up by the Rio Convention in 92. Uh, we have climate, we have biodiversity, and we have desertification. And today, particularly from an implementation point of view, as in a how do we ma manage the risks? How do we uh, make sure we're having a more positive impact, a more positive relationship with, <laughs> with our planet? Um, these three conferences don't make a lot of sense from the non-state actor point of view. So um, we um, at CISL and uh, you see this also with uh, other non-state efforts like TNFD have broadened the remit. And um, given that we work with finance and finance doesn't like you to give them more homework or make things more complicated, I can tell you that we are doing this um, very consciously because actually Otherwise, um, there would be many unintended consequences and, and, and many things that were missed. So um, the simple answer is, is that um, biodiversity is a useful um, uh, measurement for indicating ecosystem health, um, a variety of ecosystem health. You know, you might want to use mean species abundance or mean species diversity as, as measurements of ecosystem function. So biodiversity is a critical aspect um you know along with if we're talking about phrases like natural capital um but um when the rubber hits the road um we are um being broader here um and uh, the purpose is yeah the purpose is to to make sure that we don't we don't end up um having competing agendas or, or things that have unintended consequences Great, thank you, Grant. Apologies about that. I was having trouble unmuting. Uh, we have another, unless any other speakers wanted to come in on that, we will move on. Fine, okay. Um, so we have one for Henry, um, but obviously welcome uh, any other contributions as well. So how wide do you think awareness really is in financial institutions about risks associated with biodiversity loss to investments business? You seem to suggest it's not very high. And you mentioned greenwashing, our current practices such as auditing, et cetera, enough to stop greenwashing around nature, pledges and financing and prove additionality or are new rules specifically for business and finance community needed and what would those be? And if I could also sort of join on to that, one of the questions that I was thinking of as you were talking about the strong conflict of interest between increasing supply and cutting demand, um, what would it actually take for the finance sector to be aware of this problem and act on it? And how do we move away from those voluntary agreements that you measured, that, that you mentioned, sorry, as not being effective? So quite a lot in there, Henry. Um, feel free to break that down. Oh, wow. Well. Um, well, on Philippa's question, um, uh, yes. I mean, it really isn't very high, I'm afraid, because, as I say, it's not really incorporated in the accounts, that the language of, of finance is, is really about financial capital, not natural capital. And I think that is going to change as initiatives like the Task Force on Nature Related Financial Disclosure does begin to um, enforce you know, people becoming aware of it. But even then, it, it needs to be um, decision critical. It, it needs to be a part of you know, how people actually take decisions. And that means that there needs to essentially be some element of financialization. And that's indeed, you know, there were critics of, of Das Gupta for um, you know, trying to put a value on nature. Um, but it is going to be necessary if you're going to change um, behavior. Um, Helen, on your question on, on conflicts, um, you know, and, and what will it take for, for business to effectively to be forced to do this um, rather than voluntarily do it through market mechanisms, um, it will require regulation, I'm afraid. I think that comes back to this sort of supply side, demand side issue that, you know, effectively no one wants rationing. Um, but in this case, um, you know, we've only got one planet, um, it's finite, and we need to bring our sort of demand and the, and the sort of profits and business activities that are um, created from that back into into line with, with what the planet offers. Um, 
Thanks, Henry. And, and I think that that brings us back to the, the critical issue of whether or not the framework will actually be agreed by national governments and to what extent will it be implemented um, as intended uh, versus a kind of repeat of the last decade. So I think there's this issue of trying to bring everyone up to the same level and in doing that sort of reducing those transition risks as well for certain sectors. Um, which doesn't necessarily reduce the need for regulation, but right now it seems like there are some key sectors sort of working in not in not in the same direction, which I think throws in extra barriers for even companies who really want to move and make progress on these issues. So I guess one question around that is. Um, you know, could we expect the finance sector in particular or, or, or businesses in particular who see that there's a, a really big risk from biodiversity loss to their investment? Could we see them really pushing for success um, in, in Montreal? That's quite a, a general question I appreciate, but just any thoughts on that would be interesting. I think it, that there are definitely businesses who are trying to do the right thing, and we've seen some great initiatives, but escaping the tyranny of having to increase your sales and increase your profits every year is a challenge. But I think there is an opportunity, perhaps, at this COP to focus on certain sorts of businesses. You mentioned the finance sector. I think you know banks in particular and, and how their lending is, has been a, um, a really good development in, in Glasgow, in particular with GFANS. Um, maybe we need something here, which would be a sort of um uh, an alliance for biodiversity a global alliance for you know gab maybe our new acronym um from uh, montreal um but i think there is another factor to think about when we talk about business we tend to think about them as very big businesses with lots of resources the the nature of food and agriculture is is extraordinarily different from most other businesses i mean the, it's by far and away the largest employer across the world but a vast number of people who are employed in um effect you know, affecting biodiversity are very small businesses, but there is this group of, of absolutely monster, very large businesses uh, involved in um, food production and food retailing in, in particular, um, who I think could be targeted individually, could be separated out as a sort of trial group, if you like, who've got the responsibility uh, effectively and the global reach um, to actually act independently of, of trying to move the whole world in one direction at once. Um, I think we should we should definitely think about a leadership group which would include you know, large food businesses, banks, and a few other players along the lines of GFANS. Great, Henry. Do you know if that's in the works or is that a, an idea that you've just had? Well, I think Grant is certainly um, chairing one of the um, panels on on Finance Day. I, Grant, I don't know if you're going there, but um, certainly please take that that idea with you if it hasn't already been thought of. <laughs> Yeah, that's right, Henry. I am. I, I, um, I. So I totally agree with Henry's remarks, and I think that um, there are a group of uh, financial institutions uh, and businesses that, that that will lead um, in this space. And uh, if anything, something that I usually speak about as something that currently concerns us at the institute from a systems change perspective is that you end up with um, what we'd often call segregation of supply chains. Vis-a-vis, um, -vis if you are a big consumer goods company, just to give you a simple example, and you simplify your supply chains, you go from 10,000 suppliers of cocoa to 50, so that you can understand, you know, their resilience, and you can understand any sort of non-financial factors to do with those suppliers. If you do that, and what happens to all the other suppliers? So, you, so you end up with concentrations of risk and, and concentrations of, of good. Um, it's a it's another big question, but what I'm saying is that that, that is happening, and um, that is an example of uh, leaders leaders moving and leaders acknowledging the business imperative of this change. Great, thanks. I think it's important to bring that um, the elements of positive shifts that are happening, as well as the the kind of doom and gloom picture that we've focused quite a bit on so far. Um, so stemming from that, we've got a question for Isabel. So China has greater scope for a state intervention than many other countries. Is it plausible that they would intervene in financial markets to manage nature-related risks better? So could they actually potentially be a leader 
on those types of regulatory frameworks that we were talking about. Yeah, I do. I mean, one often, if you deal with China, you often hear it asserted that China being a top down, you know, authoritarian one party state has the capacity to act in um, a less compromised fashion than, shall we say, than than liberal democracies. And to some extent, that's true. Um, but but one shouldn't forget that China also has politics. China also has economics and China also has vested interests and China has all the elements that we uh, we are accustomed to in liberal democracies that just tend to be less visible, certainly from the outside, that, you know, the politics of the party are opaque, uh, accountability lines are difficult to determine and so on. So whilst it is theoretically possible, yes, and there are many examples of, of policy being declared and enacted, um, but some that it it's one of the disadvantages of that system is that the corrective um the, the the corrective mechanisms are weaker so that once a decision is made and identified with uh, leadership it is quite difficult a to feed back the negative um consequences should there be any and b to get that changed and i think we can see that on the time it's taken for zero covid to come into question in china and you know that's um isn't a straight read across, but it's, it's a symptom of the of the difficulties of that kind of um, uh, of of system. That said, I mean, just on China's approach to green finance, uh, China in 2017 began to issue green bonds and really very quickly became one of the largest issuers of green bonds in the world. It's largely domestic, um, uh, but and given the scale of China's own needs for green finance, China has been looking uh, to recruit uh, international finance into a domestic green bond market. Again, similar difficulties of understanding the rules, um, understanding the uh, accountability mechanisms, I think have been a bit of an inhibition um, for large scale uh, investment from outside China. But, you know, it's nevertheless, it's, a, I think, a positive development. Um, similar, I mentioned the Kunming Biodiversity Fund earlier, which was the, the fund that was launched at the first leg of, of this COP, which was the virtual conference in Kunming last year. And um, again, you know, um, a good initiative. China announced 183 a uh, billion dollars in energy finance to BRI countries, for example, um, that had in the past gone mostly to oil, coal, and hydropower. So, to to reverse that, um, I'm sorry, that wasn't at the in the at Kunming. That's a kind of the China's pattern of investment in exterior has been largely in in energy finance, oil, coal. And hydropower, not at all on on green finance. So when uh, Xi Jinping did announce last October a 1.5 billion yuan contribution to a fund for the protection of fauna and flora in developing countries, it was it was a welcome announcement. Um, it hasn't really taken off yet uh, because of, as I say, questions about transparency and accountability. But it is there as a statement of intent. And there is quite a lot of work in China going on on, on things like Green Belt and Road, uh, which we hope will develop into a solid policy framework. Um, the sooner the better. But, as, you know, again, it's still got some work. Uh, there's while I'm actually while I have my microphone open, there was a question from Enda Doherty on um, how dependent a good outcome at COP. 15 was on China-Canadian relations. Well, clearly it's not completely dependent, but the, the mood music is very important in these processes. And the mood music is not you know, particularly constructive between China and Canada at present and hasn't been for some time. One of the key moments in the success of Paris was a handshake between Xi Jinping and Barack Obama two years before Paris in which they pledged to work together for an outcome. And that, removed the uh, the obstacles of superpower competition and indeed turned the dynamic positive which was a really important element in the 
success of Paris. And, and we just don't have that now. We don't have it across the board in Chinese diplomacy um, or, or in you know superpower relations. And so it's not impossible to reach an agreement, but it certainly isn't helping. Brilliant. Thanks, Isabel, for covering all of those questions. Um, so just to finish with one, I just want to sort of combine a couple of questions. So we've talked about potentially quite low expectations regarding the outcomes of COP15 and having those targets agreed in, in a sufficient way. What about the financing target? What are the expectations on that? Is that expected to be resolved at COP15? Uh, if it isn't, what does that mean for the, the broader uh, global biodiversity framework? And also sort of added to that, what's the difference between private and public financing streams? So what can the former achieve that the latter can't, for example? Does private financing have an essential role in tackling biodiversity loss? And if so, um, are there some examples of that? Uh, shall we go with uh, Grant? You're unmuted. Do you want to kick us off? Yeah, no, I'd really, yeah, that, I just think that the, there's something really important to say here, which is that um, either what's on the table now is uh, in terms of the numbers on the financing proposed uh, is, is nowhere near enough. Um, so we've got 200 billion of uh, finance per year by 2030, um, in essence, seed finance, the public domain to, to, uh, to crowd in private finance. Um, and then we have uh, 500 billion um, cutting uh, harmful subsidies uh, by 2030, 500 billion a year of, of harmful subsidies being cut. Um, I think by anybody's measurements, um, we need those two numbers added together to be um, uh, well in excess of uh, a trillion a year. Um, uh, and indeed, there are even more harmful subsidies per year than a trillion per year. Um, so I think that the simplest thing for governments to do is to disclose harmful subsidies in the same way that business and finance would disclose their relationships to nature and then uh, eliminate all harmful, all harmful subsidies that are disclosed um, over a period of time. I think that would be the most powerful thing because to link it to your second question around uh, pr private versus public um, in this day and age, it is very challenging um, for the majority of global governments to uh, pay for the restoration that is necessary. Um, one could argue probably impossible. <laughs> Um, given the financial headroom that they have. So we do need to be as uh, smart about what the public money is used for as possible and the subsidies is, is the simplest place to begin. Um, that would be my perspective. Great, thanks Grant. Well, we're just about out of time, but do either of you have anything you'd want to add on to Grant's, re Grant's response, Henry? I'd mentioned one very quick thing. I mean, clearly with, with a recession looming, governments have, have no cash to really support you know the various different needs but um you know one of the big issues that is related in relation to carbon is a carbon tax and i haven't seen many um proposals because it would be very difficult to implement on a local basis but but at a very large business level again um the trade in certain agricultural commodities could certainly have um uh, some kind of, of fiscal restraint um imposed which would help raise the funds that uh, are needed Right, thank you, Henry. So we're on the hour, but Isabel, you were muted. Do you want to have the final word? Yeah, <laughs> but that's a responsibility. And actually, just very briefly, we haven't really mentioned the whole question of benefit sharing and digital sequencing, which is another way of looking at, you know, how how the finances and biodiversity could work. Another very complicated subject, which I'm introducing at the last minute. So I'm just going to put it on the table and say that's also something that those who want to follow up on on their interest in COP15 might find interesting to take a look at. I think not going to be resolved in Montreal, but very much needs to be discussed. Yeah, great, really good point. Thanks, Isabel. And thank you very much to all of our speakers. I think you've raised what is a highly complex, as Isabel said, a set of topics uh, that do have a lot of interlinks and 
um yeah i guess we will we'll wait and see what what comes out of the next two or so weeks um but thanks very much for all for sharing all of your knowledge and expertise with us today i've certainly learned a lot and uh yeah have a great rest of the day thanks everybody thanks for all of your questions in the q a as well <laughs>